Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome all of you to this live program at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Prabhudev Prasad Purdapa from Boston, Massachusetts. Dr. Purdapa completed his post-graduation from PGH Chandigarh in India and subsequently pursued fellowships in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, an adult reconstruction fellowship at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, and a fellowship in sports medicine at the Tri Orthopedic Center. He currently serves as assistant professor in Boston University School of Medicine and attending orthopedic surgeon at the VA Boston Healthcare System in Boston. He's the editor of Archives of Orthopedics Journal and also serves as peer reviewer for several high impact journals. He has published extensively across several top orthopedic journals and also has several high impact publications to his credit. If you've noticed, Dr. Purudapa has delivered a couple of lectures on our channel and it's already reached a huge audience. And today it's my great honor to bring back Dr. Prabhudeva Prasad Purdapa for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Prabhu. All right. Thank you, Hitesh, and uh, welcome everybody for this uh, today's presentation. And I'm going to be talking about um, templating in total hip orthoplasty today. Uh, let's get started. Okay, so why do we have a template and what are the reasons um, uh, we uh, do templating in total hip orthoplasty? So um, templating, preoperative templating helps us in accurate restoration of the hip biome biomechanics uh, because we can plan the hip center. Uh, we, can, um, we, can, we can know the femoral offset, uh, what it should be. And then we can also plan for the leg limbs appropriately. Um, there could be sometimes some unusual anatomies like uh, dysplastic acetabulum, protrusio, um, extreme uh, femur neck angles, and uh, sometimes there could be some significant deformities in the proximal femur. Um, so uh, uh, preoperative templating uh, helps us to evaluate all these things and plan accordingly. And uh, we can anticipate uh, and uh, accurately place the implants with uh, templating. Uh, because we can uh, you know, plan our neck cut and that determines the stem position. Uh, we can plan our cup position exactly. So all these are you know, really good advantages for preoperative templating. Um, and also um, it uh, helps us to accurately anticipate implant sizing. So this helps us uh, keeping proper sizes or appropriate sizes in operating room, especially if you are doing uh, multiple cases and uh, if you um, if you're using similar type of our same sizes, then you need to know um, uh, in advance so that you can have them available in the operating group. So what's the first step? So the most important, the first step is uh, to start with good quality, adequate radiographs. So what do we mean by that? Uh, we need to have a good AP pelvis, which includes both hip joints and both the proximal femurs, at least the proximal one third of the proximal femurs. And uh, we need to make sure that we, it meets certain criteria. So the first one being uh, the tip of the coccyx should be in line with the symphysis pubis, like shown in this X-ray. And uh, it should be about three centimeters from the symphysis pubis. So this makes sure that uh, the pelvis is not rotated and the pelvis is appropriately tilted um, so that we don't get you know, any uh, wrong information as far as the position of the acetabulum and uh, the femur. Um, and if the, if, if the coccyx is too close, then that, that we, it gives us an outlet view. And if it is um, too far away, it gives us a, like an inlet type of view. So this is how typically it should look like in um, a good quality AP pelvis X-ray. So the operator foramen should look some more like this. They are um, not too close or not too open. Um, and the coccyx is centered and it's, the pelvis is not rotated. Um, this is an um, outlet type of view. You can see the coccyx, we don't even see the coccyx here. It is um, almost completely covered with the symphysis pubis. This is like an extreme degree of outlet view. So we should avoid um, uh, X-rays like this. So you can see the operator foramen are really open and elongated in this X-ray. Um, this x-ray, this x-ray now we can see uh, the coccyx is quite far away from the symphysis pubis and the operator foramen are like you know, almost completely closed. So this is an inlet type of view. 
Um, again, we don't want to be templating on these type of X-rays. And uh, then we need to, you know, uh, identify certain important landmarks. The first one being the teardrop, which marks the inferior boundary of cup placement, and uh, the colus line, which is the um, ilioischial line, and that marks the medialmost aspect of the acetabular bony acetabulum. Um, now, uh, then uh, next we had a look for the appropriate positioning of the femur. So we need to make sure that uh, femur is appropriately rotated. Uh, as we know, typically uh, femur has about 15 degrees of antiversion. So we need to make sure that the femur neck and the head are in a profile view. So if the lesser trochanter, as you know, it's a posterior medial structure, and if you, if you are seeing too much of uh, lesser trochanter, that means the femur is externally rotated. And if you're not seeing any, like in this picture, so this one um, on the left side, the arthritic side, you don't see the lesser trochanter at all. That means uh, the hip joint, uh, the femur is internally rotated. And uh, this is often difficult because in, um, in significant severe osteoarthritis, when there is not much range of motion, um, the, it, it might be very difficult to get a good uh, profile view of the head and neck, then in that case, uh, we may have to you know, plan for templating on the normal side. Um, then uh, look for the femur neck anatomy. So um, sometimes it could be a significant varus or valgus type of femur necks, which we should know to um, so that we can plan accordingly when we're doing the total hip. Um, typically, uh, in general, uh, if you draw a horizontal line from the tip of the greater canter towards the femoral head, uh, that uh, is somewhere close to the center of the uh, hip joint. If the hip center is you know, below, like shown in this x-ray, that means the femur neck is in the varus. And if the hip center is above this line, that means it is more uh, well this type of neck. Otherwise, you can also you know, directly measure the um, angle that will give us you know, a good estimate of uh, the, whether it is a varus neck or a valgus neck. And um, obviously, femur uh, neck offset is another important one to uh, measure and uh, uh, so that we can plan for what type of implant or femur stem we have to be choosing. Uh, when we're doing total hypothoplasty. So femur neck offset is, you know, it's also called the horizontal offset. It's the uh, distance between a line drawn through the center of the femoral stem to the uh, hip center. And uh, if you uh, look at the relationship between the ischial tuberosity and the lesser trochanter, uh, that gives us an, a good uh, estimate of uh, femur neck offset. Um, the next x-ray um, you, you want to get is a good AP view of the hip joint, including the proximal part of the femur. Uh, with this x-ray, this we can uh, better evaluate the anatomy of the proximal femur. So what we need to look for is the, the type of uh, the, the bone quality in the proximal femur. Um, as you know, it can be classified, uh, it's been classified by uh, door as door A, B, and C. Uh, type A is a very thick cortex with a uh, um, very narrow femoral canal, and uh, door B is usually uh, good cortices, and the canal volume, canal uh, dimension is also pretty good. So usually most stems should uh, fit pretty good in uh, type B. Type C is thin cortices with a very wide canal. Then we may have to be planning for a cemented stem in those type of uh, uh, femoral canals. So, and also the, we can assess the position of the trochanter, like in this one, um, it, like there's a significantly deformed femur here, proximal femur. This is a really valgus type of femur. Um, all these things will help us in appropriate planning. A good lateral view of the hip. Um, so ideally a good frog leg and a cross table would be helpful. Frog leg was, uh, uh, gives us better information about the proximal femur. We can look for any deformities in the proximal femur, any increased bowing, like you can see in this. This is a pretty standard um, femur. That is, you know, standard uh, femur bow. Uh, no, no significant deformity here. Here you can see it looks like there is significant bowing of the proximal femur. 
Here you can see there is some deformity in the proximal femur, maybe from previous fracture or something. Um, a cross-table view uh, gives us uh, uh, more information about the acetabulum. Uh, sometimes the anteroposterior width of the acetabulum may be uh, not as big as the uh, superior inferior uh, uh, dimension. So we need to be aware of that. But many times it's not, again, it's not easy to get a good cross-table view. The radiology technician has to be you know, good with this. And many times this is, this is what we end up getting. You don't see, especially in big patients, you don't, you don't really see much in the acetabulum. So you may have to get repeated x-rays in that case. Uh, next, identify the challenges which are specific to that particular case. Like you can see in this x-ray here, um, there is a big osteophyte on the medial side, on the medial wall. Uh, the femur head is displayed superiorly and laterally. That means we know that there is a big um, osteophyte on the medial side, on the medial wall of the stabum. So we had to ream medially so that we can reach uh, the appropriate depth. And then there is a large inferior osteophyte here. And also that is superiorly migrated. There is, that means there is more wear and tear of the superior aspirin than stabum. So then uh, we had to anticipate that the superior part of the superior lateral part of the cup is going to be um, uncovered quite a bit. So these are all the things uh, we need to look for in the preoperative x-rays, uh, which will help us in uh, proper planning. So next is, um, so let's uh, look at uh, now what do we do about, how do we do the templating? Um, uh, let's follow a stepwise approach. The first step is to determine the magnification. And as we know, that's very important that you know, we, are, you know, we are templating, we are looking for um, somewhat, we are looking for accurate sizing of the implant. So magnification is very important. Next, uh, determine the leg length difference between the two sides. Next step is to template the cup and then go to the templating of the femoral component. Um, and then the final is the final hip reduction. So typically uh, we uh, uh, do templating on the affected side so that we know where the cup is gonna sit, we know where the stem is gonna sit, but sometimes the deformity can be so severe that it could be difficult to um, do a good templating on the affected side. Then uh, templating using the normal side for templating um, is, is, a, is a good option at that time. Um, you can do either conventional templating or digital templating. And um, in, in, in the present in a day and age, I think digital templating uh, is, is pretty much the standard. And if you have uh, availability, I think that help, makes the templating process much easier uh, with uh, digital templating. There's you know, different softwares available. Uh, so this is uh, the software I use in my practice. And I'll just uh, I have a few uh, pictures of that, um, uh, so I'll go through them. So uh, when you did, when you do the digital templating, uh, first you upload the X-rays to the software, and it will take you to a page something like this. You select the uh, the procedure you're doing, and also the side. It's important to select the side also. Um, and then the next uh, uh, step, it will take you to um, a page like this, uh, where you have to select which X-ray you're going to be using. Typically, uh, we use a pelvis AP view. Um, sometimes we can use a, a lateral view also that can, especially if there is significant deformity of the proximal femur, you can include the lateral view also for templating. Um, next step. So the step one is to determine the magnification. So again, uh, most of the softwares have um, you know, some type of uh, uh, some application for determining the magnification. Like in this, uh, this uh, particular software here, you have to have an X-ray with a marker. So you can see the marker here, and we know the size of the marker uh, beforehand. So, and we had to make sure that this marker is placed at the level of the bone in the coronal plane. Uh, this we had to educate the radiolo the radiology technicians to do this appropriate. Otherwise, they will be you know, putting this marker somewhere, um, you know, on the skin or the anterior aspect. Then you don't get a proper magnification. So it's very important. It's at the level of the femur bones. Um, 
And then, uh, so when you go to this step here, usually you can uh, click on this quick scale and uh, the software will, um, will be able to uh, find this marker and then uh, we'll be able to uh, then let the software know what size this marker is. And based on that, it will set a magnification for us. So this is uh, the next step here. So you can see the software has identified uh, the marker here and you let the software know what size that marker is. That is typically 25 millimeters. And now the software will set the magnification for you. If this is, uh, sometimes the software may not identify it by itself, then you have to use some, uh, this, this uh, application here. You can drag this one here and uh, do the appropriate sizing. If we don't have any marker, then we just have to use um, a, a typical standard magnification is about 20% or close to 20, 22%. So that's what uh, here you can just put in a number uh, about 20% magnification and that works well most of the time. Next step is uh, determining the leg lens. Again, uh, most of the softwares have some type of uh, wizards or applications to help us with determining the uh, leg lens and also determining the size of the femoral head and size of the proximal femur. So uh, they you know, call this smart hip wizard or the trans ischial line wizard. So basically um, you get a transverse horizontal line. You can use either use a trans ischial line or you can use um, a line between the two teardrops, or you can use a line between the lower part of the operator foramen also. So I gotta make sure that they are appropriately horizontal and they're um, going through the through both the sides properly. From this line, you measure the distance from this line um, to uh, the prominent part of the lesser trochanter, and that gives us the difference between the legments on the two sides. And uh, this application here, um, you can, this helps us measuring the femoral head. You place this circle uh, where the, uh, the normal femoral head is going to be. And that helps us in determining the center of the femoral head. And um, here, this box here, you can place this box, the, the four corners of the box in the proximal femur intermodulary canal. This helps in sizing of the uh, pragmal femur. And once you do that, um, then you can have uh, all this information available. So the software will tell us what's the leg length difference, what's the femoral head diameter, then the femoral offset also, and then uh, the pragmal femur canal diameter. So all this information is available. Uh, then you click on the template, uh, then uh, automatically the software will uh, bring in the acetabular cup and the stem in there, which you can move around. Um, so this is uh, usually the next screen where you can select whichever the company you want. And uh, there are, you know, all the, you have to have all the different company templates loaded into the software so that it is available for you. And then you can uh, keep changing. So the, initially the software will select the sizes for you based on the information you have given. And then you can move around these uh, implants or the templates. And then you can change the sizes. Like here, you can change the cup size, the head size, and then uh, the stem you know, size. You can choose the different diameter of the head. You can choose the different offset and the different uh, head length or the neck length. Um, so this will, and, and you can move, around, move them around to place them where you want them to be. So um, how do you template for the Stabler Cup? Where do, you, where do you place it typically? The Stabler Cup, uh, these are the two important landmarks. Again, as I mentioned before, one is the teardrop and uh, the other one is the colus line. So the uh, colus line or the ileoskill line that, is, uh, that marks the middle most aspect um, in standard hips, you don't have to go all the way uh, to the colus line, but that is an important landmark. Uh, that is the middle most aspect of the stabler cup. Uh, typically, we want to end up somewhere on the lateral aspect of the teardrop. And, uh, and the inferior aspect of the cup should be at or maybe just below the level of the teardrop. And um, 
Sorry, just let me just go back again. And the position of the stable cup depends on the uh, anatomy which is available to us. Like you can see in this X-ray, there is you know severe protrusio. Uh, then you can with uh, good templating, you you can uh, you can estimate where the cup is going to be, where you want to place the cup, and how much of bone graft you might have to pack on the medial aspect to bring the cup out um, of the protrusio. And here you can see there's a significant. Uh, uh, dysplastic hip and definitely the hip center is proximally migrated here. Um, this anatomy, uh, this is the anatomy that is available to us and we had to you know, plan the cup so that we can bring it down to where the anatomical hip center should be. Step four is uh, templating for the femoral component and uh, where, to, where do you want to place it? Uh, again, with most of the software, you can, um, you, can, you can assess where the neck cut has to be and you can determine you know, the, where the stem has to be. Um, the, you have to make sure that the stem is filling the canal appropriately. Um, it should be, this, more, you know, this is a metaphyseal filling type of stem, uh, what we call uh, the tapered stems. Um, so you can see it is filling the metaphysis nicely um, you have to make sure that uh, it is the, the, the stem is filling the canal nicely, and then you have to determine the offset of the stem. Uh, then the varus and the valgus alignment of the stem, you have to make sure that the tip of the stem is centered in the femoral canal, not in the varus or the valgus position. And uh, you can determine the neck cut also, and you can measure the where the neck cut uh, will be uh, with respect to the lesser trochanter, which you can um, you, can, uh, you can again measure during the surgery. And um, again, if you uh, know, if you evaluate the anatomy of the proximal femur, that helps in determining what type of stem you're going to be using. In large majority, uh, straightforward hip replacement, you know, this is a type of stem which you might be using. But some, if you have something like this, where the anatomy is deformed, you may not be able to use a metaphyseal filling type of stem. Then you may have to use something like a, a Wagner cone type of stem. So the final step is uh, the planned reduction of the hip joints. Once you um, uh, determine the position of the cup, determine the position of the stem, the size alignment uh, and the hip center, then once you click on the hip reduction, then the software uh, will let you know we can, um, uh, there is, uh, the software will give you all the information about uh, the leg length difference that is uh, going to be about the femur offset. Like in this picture, you can see uh, the, there was about eight millimeter of shortening. And with all this, what we have done, uh, we are lengthening the left side by 7.5 millimeters. There's still a difference of about 0.5. Again, you can move the stem up and down um, to increase this, uh, decrease the leg length difference. And the offset was about 42 millimeters. And now we are uh, lateralizing the offset by about 1.5 millimeters. That means we are pretty close. We are recreating the offset. We are recreating the leg length difference. And our cup is placed around 40 degrees of inclination. And again, you can see here uh, the, the colus line. Uh, this, is, this cup is placed more in the anatomical position. It is along the, just along the lateral aspect of the teardrop. And uh, the inferior most aspect of the cup is just below the level of the teardrop. And that's where you want to be typically. So that's uh, about uh, the templating. That's, uh, you know, this, those, those are all the steps for uh, doing a good templating, preoperative templating of a total hip so that we can um, go in and do the surgery confidently and recreate the anatomy. So once we, um, I'll just go, go through a few x-rays about how we evaluate the postoperative x-rays after we do uh, total hip arthroplasty. Again, the same thing. We need to have good um, quality x-rays, make sure that the coccyx is in line with the symphysis pubis. In this x-ray, you can see that it is not in line and the pelvis is rotated. So you may not get a good assessment of the antiversion of the cup. Um, again, operate from, you can see it is, you know, it is narrower compared to the right side here. Um, then you evaluate the inclination of the acetabulum with respect to this horizontal line. 
and uh, where the height of the cup is and where the depth of the cup is uh, based on the teardrop and the chorus line again. Uh, you need to get a good cross table lateral view, make sure that the radiology, you know, you educate the radiology technicians not to do a frog leg lateral view after hip replacements. Um, so a good uh, cross table lateral view, we can see and uh, we can uh, measure the antiversion of the cup and also antiversion of the femur stem. When, uh, when you're uh, looking at the femoral stem, uh, we can evaluate the leg length difference again based on this horizontal line and measuring the distance from the lesser trochanter to the horizontal line, or you can measure to the hip center also. And then you can compare the offsets by looking at the relationship between the shield of velocity and the lesser trochanter. Um, again, uh, uh, then a horizontal line from the tip of the lateral trochanter to the tip of the hip center will give us a good evaluation of the femur neck angles. And then the stem size, um, look for the canal fill here. Like in this picture, the stem is nicely filling the canal all over. Look for any periprosthetic fractures, obviously, and look for the various valgus alignment. The tip of the femoral stem is in the center of the canal here. So in this study, they found that the most common errors um, during total hip orthoplasty after the template, uh, total hip orthoplasty were excessive leg lengthening. And uh, interestingly, they found that it's because of the inferior stabler placement below the teardrop level and also excessive femoral offset, uh, which is because of inadequate medialization of the stabler component, thereby increasing the offset of uh, the, uh, the hip joint. So a good preoperative planning will help us in preventing or uh, at least minimizing these uh, common errors. So in summary, uh, preoperative templating is extremely helpful in a good planning for a total hypothoplasty. It improves the accuracy and precision of uh, implant placement. Uh, it's important to get adequate good quality preoperative radiographs and follow a stepwise approach for templating. And digital templating definitely is uh, helpful compared to conventional templating. Uh, that will help and uh, help us in executing the preoperative planning in, uh, intraoperatively to create the normal anatomy for that patient. All right. Thank you, Prabhu. Uh, thank you for yet another brilliant talk from your side. A uh, couple of questions. Sure. Uh, Prabhu, you mentioned about the marker, right? So you said the marker was yeah. the center. No, what we used to do before is we used to keep the lead uh -huh. marker at the level of the trochanter. Yeah. The trochanter is a uh -huh. prominent part and you used to strap it. So do you yeah. think it's a reliable strategy? Because you're at the level of the bone, you're not deep, not superficial. You're right. I, th I think that's a good strategy. As, uh, definitely. So if you place it right at the level of the trochanter, uh, that works well. Yes. So, but sometimes, you know, they, what they do is, especially in big patients, uh, like, you know, if you're dealing with BMI 40 patients, your that marker may not be in the picture. So that could be an issue. Um, so that's uh, otherwise, yes, that, that works well. Yes. And uh, the other concern is the distance between the beam source and the cassette. Mm -hmm. I remember we've been taught that a 45 inch film, right? A one meter X-ray is the ideal scenario. So do you instruct the radiographer or is all, are all the X-rays taken in with that particular distance? Yes, that's that's what they are. That's what they uh, do for most of the, if you, if you're just, you know, not for preoperative template, sometimes when we plan for the hip arthroplasty, uh, when we order the X-rays, we say this is pre-arthroplasty uh, x-ray with the marker. So they, they have to be extra careful for doing that. Um, otherwise, even when you're just getting a hip x-ray for some, you know, uh, some patient with, uh, in an outpatient clinic, then also they, you know, definitely try to make sure that, uh, they are doing the proper, uh, x-ray. And Prabhu, see, we have viewers from different parts of the world where they do not have access to a digital templating software. So do you think a conventional templating 
works equally well. There are a lot of uh, studies that looked at comparison between digital templating versus the conventional templating with x-rays and get all your plastic sheets and you measure the length. So do you think it's still valid enough or do you think there's a significant difference with digital templating over a conventional one? No, it definitely works well. There is no doubt about it. Um, so, but you just have to make sure that you're, you know, like like same in the digital templating, if you're putting in wrong information, you're not going to get a you know, good uh, outcome uh, from that. So there is no doubt conventional templating is uh, been used for a long time. It works very well it, as long as you do it appropriately. Only thing is the digital templating makes it easier. That's it. So because you have all those wizards available, so it makes it easier. I don't think it is any more accurate than the conventional templating. Uh, it works equally well. And also one needs to really cross check intraoperatively with your already determined uh, measurements, right? Because uh, if you you need to cross check, otherwise your templating may be wrong and you may do the surgery with the wrong template. So proper correlation is equally important, isn't it? That is very important. There is no doubt about it. That's a very good question. So you have to make sure that you're cross-checking. It's not just your, you know, you do the templating. All right, we did the templating and the stem size was uh, five or six, whatever. And then intraoperatively, when you start broaching the femur canal and if you start going up, it should be based on what you see intraoperatively. And, uh, um, and also, if you have templated for a size uh, 56 cup and intraoperatively you feel that that is not enough, it definitely has to um, you know, go up on the size or maybe a smaller size. And also the hip stability is the most important thing, which we always check. Um, so it's not just based on templating, it will help you in um, knowing what size you're going to be mostly using and also um, helps in doing the surgery better, but it is not, um, you know, you should not be completely dependent on the templating. That's true. You need to cross check um, during the surgery. Yes. Thank you, Prabhu. Just one last question before we wind up the session. Now, what do you think is the role for intraoperative x rays? I worked with surgeons in Barcelona. I have gone for a fellowship and they use a super path mini approach. When they do an MIS approach, they try to get intraoperative x-rays to check everything is all right. So do you do that? And also immediate post-op before the patient is shifted out of the operation theater, check x-ray to roll out there's no dislocation. So yeah, another good question. So um, I do both posterior approach, posterior lateral approach and retainer approach. So posterior lateral approach, the patient is in the lateral position. Um, no, I don't get any hip x-rays. I think there have been many studies on that. Uh, because the intra, because the positioning of the, because the patient is in the lateral position, it's difficult to get a good AP pelvis X-ray. So, if you are trying to evaluate your uh, stem or cup position, uh, that's probably not, not. I don't think it's helpful. Um, and uh, stability is you have to make sure that is something we, which you check uh, obviously. And I don't get any immediate post-op X-rays um, in the in the PACU or anything. So you know, if you are worried about the dislocation, obviously you can examine the patient, and then you should be able to evaluate it. I don't think there's any use in that. Again, they when when the radiology techs come and do the X-rays, those are usually poor quality X-rays. You don't make you know you you won't be able to do a good assessment of the position of the implants. Um, in the anterior approach. Again, there are many surgeons uh, who do direct anterior approach without x-rays. It can be done um, as long as you have a good exposure. But because the patient is supine and it is easier to do the x-ray, um, that too, in, when you're starting off with an anterior approach, it is a good idea to do, use the x-rays. So yeah, um, if you're doing something like an anterior approach when the patient is supine, you can probably get better quality x-rays. You can move the position in the CM or maybe an X-ray better so that you can get a better evaluation of the components. But in posterior approach or direct lateral approaches, I don't think it is much helpful. Thank you, Prabhu. Prabhu, I think that's all the questions that we have for this session. Thank you for yet another fantastic lecture. And I'm sure this is going to benefit a lot of people all over the world. Thank you so much for joining in, Prabhu. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you.